नमस्कार लाइफ इज अबाउट द चॉइस दैट यू मेक इन योर लाइफ आई वॉज फिफ्टीन वेन आई वॉज गैंग रेप्ड बाय एट मैन आई हैड टू चॉइस बिफोर मी वन चॉइस वॉज टू बी अ विक्टिम हाइड माई फेस इन शेम एंड गिल्ट कन्फॉर्म टू द सोसाइटल नॉर्म्स दैट आई हैड टू बी a shamed of what happened to me i had another choice to be a survivor to fight back to care a hoot about what the world thought i chose to be a survivor i also made another choice i chose to dedicate my existence my life to fight sex crime and sex slavery like any other choices in our life every choice has a con- consequence consequence about what is the kind of social life or relationships that you're going to have if you make this choice consequences about how you want to view the world what is the perspective what is the lens that you will carry consequences how you will lead your life from then on and most importantly what is your quotient of happiness i had to make these and feel these consequences in a context where i was socially rejected i was ostracized i was victimized for a crime that i had not committed and i made a choice for others who have been sexually violated or enslaved in sex slavery So what is the kind of choice I was making? I was making choices for children like these. On my left is this 9-year-old child. She's an orphan. She was brought up by her aunt. At the age of 4, her auntie put her in a tea stall to work. At the age of 5, This child was sold to a pimp. And for the next 4 years, this child was sold and resold in different red light areas in India. Thousands of men raped her. And at the age of 9, she was thrown on the highway in the city where I work. The child to my right is 3 years old. She doesn't come from a poor family. In fact, She comes from a very well-to-do family. Her father is a government officer. Mother is a software engineer. That day was her first day in school. In the afternoon when she came back from school, she was crying, crying profusely, and when her mother saw her and saw her look down, with blood flowing down, the child was immediately rushed to the hospital. And when the pediatrician checked her, they said somebody must have inserted a blunt object inside the vagina maybe a fist of a person these are young children who have been violated sexually assaulted or kept in sex slavery i made a choice for these children i made a choice of fighting two kinds of things one that's an individual liberation another which is an organized crime a billion dollar industry and over 165 countries in the world face that problem while it is easy and lofty to think about you want to do this you want to change the world it's it's kind of an ambition aspiration until and unless you don't equip yourself with the skills with the education to fight that you can't do it it just remains a wish in your mind and i had to equip myself at the age of 15 with an education that was appropriate to fight this fight with professional skills and then i realized that i can't do it alone and one individual cannot change this it has to be done with many others together and therefore the biggest challenge was how do you transfer your madness to somebody else especially in a context where we are asking people to stake their lives 
to, cry, to fight an organized crime. You could be beaten up, you could be physically assaulted, you could be killed, you could be isolated from your own families. You, you're making people believe that it is right to do something like that. How do you transfer that madness in, in people? And most importantly, starting something is very, very easy. How do you sustain it? How do you keep it going? I started with a small beginning. I started educating children of women in prostitution as a kind of second generation prevention so that these children will not be subjected to the same kind of violence their mothers were subjected to. Today, we have been educating more than 10,000 children in 21 learning centers across my state. And that expanded to a huge community awakening program, awakening the community to take vigilance as a part of their existence. It also then led to hundreds and thousands of them pledging their lives to fight this crime. Of course, not just prevention. In the course of time, I started actually getting involved in rescue work going with the police, rescuing children and young people from brothels and places of exploitation. A very, very adventurous activity, a James Bond kind of activity, where you actually go in and pull out young people who have been enslaved. All this and more started showing results, started showing impact. There was a dent in the organized crime. There's a dent in the revenue people were making by selling of human beings and getting them raped. And that started another level of problems. Problems where your integrity is questioned. Problems where your actions are questioned. Problems where your intentions are questioned. Problems where your vision is que questioned. Especially in a context where you're facing challenges from three different types. At one end, you have the victims that you are serving who are hostile to you. They have so much got normalized to the exploitation that they are subjected to. Another end, you have the traffickers, the mafia, who don't want you to exist. Another end, which is far, far, far more difficult, an uh, end where each one of us sitting here is a part of the social attitude and perception where we, we somehow have gained PhDs in victimizing a victim. We don't believe that they are part of us. It is in that context of barriers that you're creating small pathways. And what helped me is the truth that I was demonstrating. And what is the truth that I was demonstrating? I had removed over 22,500 young girls out of sex slavery. My truth was I had set up one of the biggest rehabilitation centers, therapeutic community, a safe space for reflection and recovery and rehabilitation for thousands of survivors of sex trafficking. A truth where thousands of young girls today are living a very, very viable, sustainable life as camera assistants, camera women, as welders, as carpenters, as fabricators, as bookbinders, as printers, as even masons working in construction companies. Thousands of them gaining the strength to start life afresh. I believe one of the things in my journey is the end is important, but the means to an end is as important as the end itself. And yet, no matter how much you think that today is the only day, there cannot be any tomorrow, and you live for the moment, there are times of self-doubt. There are times when you start questioning yourself. There are times when you actually start losing faith and actually start asking, am I in the right path? Two such moments happened just three years back in my life. It was a morning, a Monday morning. I was sitting in my office and I get a call from the police station nearby, requesting me to come immediately to the police station because they had a young victim and they would need my assistance to take the statement of this child. 
I was expecting a 10 or 12 year old child there. I was expecting that yes, it's going to be very traumatic, very anguishing, but nothing prepared me for this. There was this one and a half year old baby raped by 12 men. For the first time in my life, I froze. I froze to such an extent that I could not deal with that case. For the first time in my life, I recused myself and referred this case to another professional colleague of mine. The same evening, something else happened. Back home, I was just sitting and having a cup of tea when two men called me, two citizens, a very concerned citizens, and said, we are very anguished. Some video has come in our WhatsApp. Can you do something about it? I said, please, just send it. Let me see. I got the videos, and I just looked in. I just started puking. I was so nauseous. What was in front of me was a video of a 12-year-old child who was being gang raped by 14 men. A live video. Another video was a single rape, but this young woman was being raped by a man. A third person was recording the entire thing. What shocked me was the look on their faces. The look of sheer delight and happiness on the faces. These are pictures grabbed from the videos. The look that not only I will do this crime, I will flaunt it, I will circulate it, because I just don't care what you will do to me, because none of y'all will do anything to me. I fought back. I started one of the biggest campaigns in the world, the Shame the Rapist campaign, where I exposed these men and appealed to the public, appealed to the civil society to find them, to, to just trace these guys out so that we can take necessary actions against them. We fought. We fought in the Supreme Court. My legal counsel and dear friend Aparna Bhatt is also with me today in this wonderful gathering. Very interesting people got arrested. A builder, a big man, a construction builder who is so wealthy, actually raping his girlfriend and employee. A young boy who is a software engineer, who is the upholder and disseminators of such videos in India. In his desktop, we found 600 videos, which is of only rape and gang rape. What scared me was two things. One, what is this impunity? What is this environment of impunity that all of us have collectively created, which gets, gives confidence to these perpetrators, not only to commit the crime, but actually flaunt it on our faces and say, yes, I will do it, and you can't do anything about it. The second thing that bothered me is this huge technological firms, Facebook, YouTube, Google, WhatsApp, Instagram. None of these people, we are right now fighting them in the Supreme Court. None of this, none of these technological companies are willing to take accountability for the content on their platform. They're fighting us. They're saying freedom of speech. They're talking about privacy when rape and gang rape videos are being circulated on their platforms. It is in this context. I ask each one of you all whether gender equality is possible. Is it possible at a time when each one of us are choosing to be silent? And when I'm saying silence, I'm not just talking about doing a conference, a seminar like this, and talking about rape and gang rape, or having an exhibition outside this hall. I'm talking about the silence in our souls, silence in our conscience, when we make a choice, when it happens in our own families, the abuse, the molestation, and we choose to remain silent in the name of honor, in the name of prestige, in the name of shame, 
do we realize that we are creating a culture of impunity? We are creating an enabling environment for perpetrators to do what they have to do. Is gender equality possible when we are so passive? We find excuses not to do anything about it. We're so complacent about it. We're so comfortable. We're so normalized about it. Is gender equality possible when we have become so tolerant? And it is so ironic. We are so intolerant about so many things. Five centimeters of our borders, our language, our religion, anything. We are so intolerant about it globally individually, collectively, yet you listen to a story of a one-and-a-half-year-old baby, gang raped, killed, murdered. It's just a story. Nothing moves us. Is it possible to change the world in this environment of silence, passivity, and tolerance? Until and unless we don't become a zero-tolerant community globally, I don't think anything can change. Have I changed anything? Have I changed the world? I don't know. I really don't know what I've changed. But what I know is I've changed the world of that one child that I've removed from sex slavery. I know that in her world, I'm giving her some safety. And I hope today, each one of us sitting here will find the strength in our conviction strength and courage in our own being to find little ways to respond, find little ways to challenge the stereotypes around us so that together we make a world which is safe for all, better for all, equal for all. Thank you so much.